Hello, students. <laughs> this is evolutionary reasoning. And um, this first little uh, toy lecture I want to give you is partially to introduce a little bit of terminology. Like you need a little bit of vocabulary in order to make evolutionary arguments. And then also I'm going to give you not the general theory of adaptation by natural selection. That, like making it general is a little bit hard. Instead, I'm going to give you kind of uh, an imaginary example or a, a little toy example which I think will be just scratching the first surface of your understanding of it. Now, even if you accept the toy example, I don't know that that gets you very far, but at least uh, after this lecture, I hope that we can um, have conversations that kind of use that, uh, th that terminology and then that kind of argument. So uh, to get started, Here's uh, two definitions that I kind of need. First, a genetic locus is something that corresponds to a place on a chromosome. We could get more sophisticated about what that means, but at any rate, you know, organisms have chromosomes, and there are different places on these chromosomes, and so we could speak of the different places on the chromosome as genetic loci. And then many quantitative traits, like how tall things are, or how long their horns are, or um, the relative lengths of this part of the arm to this part of the arm, anything like quantitative like that, the relative size of your head, I think those quantitative things uh, at least have the potential to be partially affected by multiple genetic loci. So in other words, there's different places on the chromosome that could potentially contribute to how tall an organism is. Now, something like height might also be affected by various aspects of the environment. So just because I might assert that uh, height has, say, a 40% uh, genetic basis in a particular experimental population, that doesn't really mean that there's not a huge effect of the environment in all sorts of different ways. Unless you're right at zero or right at 100%, then, um, you know, like nature-nurture argument is kind of a weak thing to even talk about because both are obviously contributing. You couldn't be here if it weren't for your genes, and you couldn't be here if it weren't for the fact that you were fed. Okay, now I want to distinguish between a genetic locus and then another sense of the way we use the word gene. So sometimes we use the word gene to mean genetic loci, and then other times we use the word gene to mean a genetic allele. An allele uh, is an alternative form of a gene at a locus. So let's say we had 10 different places on the chromosomes that could potentially affect how tall an organism is. Then in each of those 10 different places, you could have one allele in the population, in which case it contributes no variation. Or you could have two alleles, one that made the organism taller and one that made it shorter. Or you could have three alleles, one that made it taller, one that made it kind of medium, and one that made it shorter, and so on. Um, and these alleles, uh, can be any number in a large population. Um, they can have deleterious effects. So in other words, you could have an allele that made the organism work less well and be less successful. They could have beneficial effects that make the organism, the individual, uh, work better and be more successful. Or you could have alleles that are neutral, that are equivalent to one another in terms of their effect on the success of the organism. And then new alleles, new alleles are produced by mutation. So you have a copy of a gene, and in the process of cop making a new copy, a mistake is made. So mistakes are kind of inevitable. Like if you, have make, if you copy things enough times, there will be some mistakes. And so mutations create new alleles, because if you start out with one allele, and then there's a copying mistake, then you've got two alleles that differ. And then if that copying mistake is passed on as, as the copy is copied, then you could get a lot of different copies of 
that uh, new mutation. <clears throat> and we should say that this whole process uh, is not directed uh, by what would be valuable if the whole thing had foresight. Like it doesn't require that there's any kind of foresight. That doesn't mean that there aren't more frequently uh, deleterious mutations than beneficial mutations. It doesn't mean that you can't have one organism, one species, let's say, that has one mutation rate and another organism, another species, that has a different mutation rate. It just means that when you take an organism and move it to a new environment, then that doesn't stimulate it to make mutations that are apt to that new environment. Mutations are just made all the time. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Okay, so I want to give you this... Um, it's a specific example, although it's an imaginary one. Um, and really, my goal is very modest here. It's not really to shake your world. It's really to infect your brain with a little bit of an idea. And that, brain, and that little infection, then, I'm hoping will be a kernel that we can build other things around. You've probably heard of this before, but uh, I chose an example which I think is cute. Uh, so here it is. Let's start with a population of shrubs that lives in a place like Southern California. And then let's say that there's some bird that takes a whole bunch of seeds of this shrub and flies off to a new island a newly created island in the middle of the Pacific where there's hardly any other uh, woody plants. Um, and this new place in the, on this island is humid. It's much, more, it's much moister than in Southern California. Let's just say it gets the same amount of precipitation every month of the year. Now, the shrubs, they start out on the mainland being from three to five feet tall and uh, let height partially be affected by 10 genetic loci. Each of these potentially uh, make new alleles by mutation, and from time to time, the plants then have the potential to be shorter or taller, depending on whether those new alleles cause the plant to grow taller or shorter, right? So now we will have, we'll end up after a little while with a population that varies in how tall the plants are. There'll be some individual plants that are two feet high, then there'd be other individual plants that are five feet high. Very rarely, but you know, a few of them. Uh, and at least there would be some that would be three feet high and, three, and others that would be four feet high. Now let me further stipulate and imagine that it is actually the truth that adding height on the humid island uh, allows the tall individuals to photosynthesize more and to overshadow their neighbors, their immediate neighbors, and cause those neighbors to photosynthesize less. So there's a relative difference in the amount of photosynthesis of the tall individuals over the short individuals. And that this results in, I'm further assuming that this results in the tall individuals making more seeds than the short individuals because the short individuals are overshadowed by the tall individuals. <clears throat> and uh, so then what I think will happen is that evolution will proceed. Now, here's a lot of words here. The first bullet point, I'm just going to call that the premise of heritability. And, and like, we could argue about whether that's true or not on this island, but since it's in my, the island is in my brain, I'm going to specify it's true. And I'll just label that the premise of heritability. And then the second one, I'll call the premise of phenotypic selection. Phenotype refers to the outward uh, characteristics of the organisms, the traits of the organisms. Okay, so now I can abbreviate those things and move on. So now I've got the two bullet points, but there are fewer words. And this is what I think will happen. Uh, over the generations, the population will accumulate a high frequency of those alleles that tend to make their bearers tall. I'll call those the tall alleles. 
at the various genetic loci, at these 10 genetic loci. And then from time to time, new mutations uh, will arise that make some plants short, and they will be selected out. So those new mutations that arise that tend to make the plant short, I think they will go down in frequency. They won't be very common in the population. Whereas new m mutations that arise that tend to make the plants tall, they will rise up in frequency. And they'll start out being just, you know, one, one out of all of the different gene copies that are in the population. And then they'll rise up to like 100% or near 100%. And then I for, further predict that because there's these 10 um, loci and because there's the potential to make lots and lots of alleles through mutation, that eventually, after some number of generations, we'll have the evolution of things we would call trees. They'll be tall. In fact, the, the average individual will grow to be uh, much, much taller than the tallest plant ever found on the continent of that lineage. Now, we could say a few things about this. First, becoming trees is a bit bad for the species because um, what's really happening here is that the plants are taking a lot of their photosynthesis and they're putting it into making wood and wood is not particularly good, right? I mean, the only reason that being tall is good is because other individuals, you, you overshadow other individuals, right? It would be great if all the plants could just decide, we're going to lay flat on the ground. We're not going to put anything into wood, which is expensive and it's risky. You know, you might get blown over if you grow tall. That would be a much better way to make the most seeds for that population for that species, would make the most seeds being short. But any individual that cheated on the arrangement, any individual that happened to have a mutation that made them a little bit taller, they would make their neighbors then be in the shadow. And so their neighbors wouldn't make as many seeds. And so in the next generation, the proportion of seeds that came from the tall plant would be higher than the proportion of seeds that came from the short plant. And we could also say that this process is a little bit unlike what's been happening on the continent. Because on the continent, it's arid. You know, it doesn't rain that much, at least for long periods of the summer. And so on the continent, um, the plants are not competing for photosynthetic light. They're competing for water. And so on the continent, it's not the case that taller plants can just grow taller and outcompete their neighbors because in doing so, they would need to have more water and they don't have more water. And so you could see then how you would get adaptive differentiation of these two populations on the island and on the continent. I could add a few other notes. In fact, I could add quite a lot of notes to this argument, um, but let me just sort of uh, end with more definitions, and that is I'll say that phenotypic selection is the relationship between traits and fitness, and fitness um, we can say is going to be a complicated term, but it's more or less the number of offspring uh, that are produced. So it's not how brawny you are if you go to the gym. You could have, you know, like really frail uh, organisms that are not brawny at all, but they are able to program computers, and because they're able to program computers, they take over the world, right? That could be uh, high fitness. But anyway, phenotypic, phenotypic selection is where we're thinking of a graph, and on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, you have the trait. So you have height from short to tall. And on the y-axis, I'm painting, a, I'm painting a picture in your mind. And on the y-axis, you have something like the number of uh, seeds that are produced by these plants. And so phenotypic selection is when there's a relationship between those two 
um, measures of an individual, where each point is an individual in the population. Now, we will develop a more nuanced definition of I, I think, eventually, but this will be enough to get started. Uh, and then we might say that evolution, at least at this level, I mean, we could also, we could, if you wanted to, you could add in front of evolution micro, so microevolution. Microevolution is something that happens to populations, not just to individuals, uh, and it is change in allele frequency across the <coughs> generations. So in, our, in my imaginary example, as you go from one generation to the next to the next, then you'll have alleles that started out in low frequency and that have the effect of making the plants that bear them tall. And those alleles will have been rare at one point in time, and then they will become very common. In fact, when they first arise, their frequency is one out of the number of copies of the, uh, of the gene in the population. Because these plants, I'm imagining, each have two copies of a gene, then if there's n individual plants on the island, let's say it's 1,000, then there's two n gene copies at any particular locus. And when a new mutation arises, the frequency of that new allele is 1 over 2 n. 1 over 2 n. That's where it starts, and then I think that the ones that make it for tall, make the organisms tall, they go towards 100%, and the ones that make it short, they stay close to, to zero. And that is really all that I had to say about that.